Hello, in this lecture we're going to talk about how Spanish colonization begins to change. And we're going to talk about the time period about late 1700s to the early 1800s, really probably stop around 1800. Um, and then the next lecture we'll pick up uh, right before what leads to the Mexican Revolution and the end of Spanish rule. But uh, last time we talked quite a bit about the establishment of the missions and in this lecture, we're going to talk more about the challenges that begin to occur, secularization, which is essentially like uh, much less influence of a church. And so something secularized, it is has to do with private industry so um, or privatization, really. So in this lecture, we'll talk quite a bit about that. Um, but in order for us to really understand what's happening in Spanish Texas, we're going to back up a little bit and we're going to talk about what's happening around the world at the time because it has a great influence on what's happening in Spanish Texas. So one of the first things we'll talk about is the Seven Years War. Now, if you took a U.S. history class, you know, in high school or middle school or you took it, uh, you know, previously U.S. History one, you might have heard about this war, but it was called um, the it was called actually the French and Indian War in the colonies. And notice the Seven Year War, if you're doing the math there. Um, well, it actually really starts in 1754 in the colonies, and that's where they call it the French and Indian War. And they actually call it the French and Indian War because the French and their Indian alliances are the ones that lose. So it used to be they called it, you know, the War of the Losers, really. They used to name wars that way. But anyway, um, kind of digressing a little bit. But what I want to talk about specifically is the fact that this really begins in Europe, uh, the tension in Europe that spills into the colonies. And then it leads to uh, a lot of rivalry um, between different European powers. And of course, that spills into the colonies as well. Um, Spain made the alliance with France and, uh, and they lose. So the French lose this and um, they have to cede, which means to give Florida or Florida, as they called it at that time, um, to England. OK, and um, although they lost Florida, they'll eventually gain it back through treaty. Um, they do gain the entire area of Louisiana. The French are essentially completely pushed out of North America. And um, that's important to really all of the Americas. They do hold on to Haiti, but that's only until like 1797 when there's a slave revolt. Um, so it's pretty significant. So let's look at a map to get a visual of, of that and that loss. OK, so this in particular is what the claims look like before the French and Indian War. And you can see um, they actually gained this entire territory of Louisiana. OK, now that's kind of significant for a couple reasons to, to the Spanish. Now, on one hand, they lose Florida, and that was a really big, important colony to them. They, it was you know, much more successful than Texas was to them, or more, probably more valuable. Um, but they take out this, the French threat. Remember that they established uh, missions and presidios along the border in East Texas, specifically because of the French encroachment on their land. So the fact that they gain this territory is significant. OK, but in the next lesson, um, we'll actually talk about the fact that they end up having to give that back with the rise of Napoleon in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. Another thing that's happening and is, is very significant to what's happening in the mindset of what's happening in the colonies is the fact that the Enlightenment was happening in Europe at that time. Now, if you know anything, if you had a world history class, you know a little bit about this. Essentially, it's this push away from the church. It really decentralizes a lot of power that the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church had. Well, really more of a Protestant thinking, but it really takes scientific thinking into account. Now, this is important because this really is one of the factors that leads to the secularization um, of the mission. So they move away from focusing on converting the Indians and more into like economic and scientific thought. Um, Charles III was a Habsburg, uh, you know, um, leader, um, and he uh, was an enlightened thinker. And so he wanted to no not only curb and take away the power of the Catholic Church, he also distrusted Creoles if you re if you remember what that was from the from the Costa system, those were people that uh, were of Spanish blood but were born um, in the colonies. And essentially, what that means is they think that they're too far separated from 
uh, from the, you know, from Spain and that they have more of an interest of the colonies rather than of the motherland. And so he kind of distrusts them. He's also heard of like, horrible things that are happening in the colonies and the large Indian threat in the northern part of um, New Spain, which is, of course, you know, Tejas, right? Um, and also he's worried about the weakened military. He's worried about the British um, and their threat and their beginning of their encroachment. So he appoints somebody to become a new administrator of the colonies. And this name was Galvez. And um, so he goes out into Spain I'm sorry, into New Spain, and he um, does a couple significant things, okay? He does an inspection, and we're going to talk about what he said in his inspection, but one of the things that he does uh, in particular is he divides up New Spain into 11 provinces, okay? At that time, it was called Intendencias, and, uh, and he does talk about the indigenous threat um, that all of these um, regions, but particularly in the northern part of the colony, are really um, are really looking at. Okay, so let's take a look at a map. Now this map is from 1810, so eventually Spain does get Florida back um, through treaty with the British, but at least you can get kind of the idea of how uh, the different provinces were broken out around this time period. Okay, so that kind of gives you a visual there. All right, so um, I told you I'd talk a little bit about the inspection of the provinces. Um, they, he assigns Galvez, who's the new administrator, assigns a man named Marquis, uh, the Marquis de Ruby, and he does an inspection of the provinces um, in 1766. Another kind of important note about this, um, even though he goes out in 1766, he makes it to North Texas a year later, about 1767. Um, he, they don't implement any of his changes or recommendations for five years. A lot of that has to do with the thick bureaucracy and red tape that was happening really in, in Spain at that time. Uh, but basically, he says a few things. The first thing he talks about is a large concern of the Apache, particularly the Lipan Apache um, that is around the San Antonio um, area in between East and West Texas, or, I'm sorry, East and Central Texas. Um, but he also talks about East Texas, which actually is today Louisiana. Um, but the capital at that time was a city called Las Adeas, and um, it was really unsuccessful. And uh, we're gonna talk about the difference between those two here in just a minute, but he recommends actually, one of his first recommendations is to close down Las Adeas and to remove the new capital to San Antonio de Bejar. And that's of course how San Antonio became, um, it's the second capital of New Spain. And so let's take a look at a comparison between the two, uh, two cities, right? Why he might have made that suggestion, okay? The first problem of Las Adeas was the fact that there was a lot of corruption in Las Adeas, um, as opposed to San Antonio that at that time had created five very successful missions. Um, one of the other big problems is that the missions had gotten away or Las Adeas had gotten away from its, its primary objective, which was to convert indigenous peoples. Neophytes are indigenous peoples that are in um, a mission that are actively being converted. That's what a neophyte is. And I might use that term before, okay? So in San Antonio, there was actually a large neophyte population and there was a large mix of different types of people. Remember by this time, the Canary Islanders had settled. And so San Antonio was becoming a very, um, very diverse and successful settlement. Uh, part of the corruption that was happening in Las Adeas was the fact that uh, military officers were really um, using their funds in order to, you know, build their own coffers. In other words, they would use their soldiers under them to do farming and make profits and selling. So they were looking out for themselves, not really doing what they were there for. In San Antonio, um, there was a large farming and textile. We're going to talk about ranching that really begins in the missions and a very successful area. They even began a, a kind of a textile, um, business too. Uh, it was a very fertile region. Um, it, so was East Texas, but it really wasn't, you know, operating as successfully. Um, but he does mention that even though San Antonio is successful, he does make note of the fact that the military was pretty ill-equipped. Okay. So his recommendations uh, between these two cities are to really kind of revamp um, the Presidio system in New Spain and the northern part of New Spain. 
Um, he calls this the Reglamento para Presidios. So basically, recommendations for the Presidios in 1772. And so um, basically, these are, again, reforms because of the Ruby inspection, overhaul the Presidios, add Presidios, put them all at like a 30 degree longitude or latitude, I'm sorry, um, from the Gulf of California in you know, the western part of modern United States to Texas. Okay, so to try to make a line of Presidios. He wanted to also elect officers, have officers elected at each Presidio um, that would maintain the finances. Okay, I'm going to move myself a little bit over here. He also wanted um, to, and this is going to become significant, support trade with the Comanche over the Apache. So we're going to talk about the Comanche in just a minute, but essentially one of the things that uh, Ruby talks about is the fact that he does not believe that the Apache are convertible. He thinks they're wild. He thinks that there have been, you know, efforts to uh, make agreements with the Apache that have failed. So he actually favors the Comanche, which is a new group that comes to light over the Apache. And actually the governor at that time didn't really agree with that. Uh, but what's kind of interesting is that he went along with what Ruby had suggested anyway. Um, and that's gonna be, you know, a problem much later on because the Comanche uh, were definitely a force to be reckoned with. So let's talk about the Comanche um, themselves, okay? So the Comanche tribe, um, a Comanche indigenous group came from the Eastern Shoshones. Um, and they kind of migrated down. So they become a group that was divert, that, that really came from the Shoshone. The Shoshone were not like buffalo following. They were really worked with um, fishing and things like that, but they really transform um, over time. And this really begins uh, post Pueblo revolt. They're extremely um, competitive with the Apache and they begin to acquire the horse which is gonna become absolutely essential to the Comanche. Um, and they get this really after the Pueblo revolt, they begin trading or stealing and raiding and, and gaining Apache. Uh, they migrated uh, towards Texas in the area north of San Antonio. This area later, later on is gonna be known as Comancheria. I wanna point out that um, this book, if you haven't heard about it, it's The Empire of the Summer Moon. If you're really interested in the Comanche, this is a great book about them. And I will caution you that it really focuses on the brutality of the Comanche of Quanta Parker, which we'll talk about later on. It comes around later on. Um, but I also want to like, again, just wanna caution you that this particular book is pretty brutal, but it's a, a very interesting book about the history of the Comanche if you're really interested in the Comanche themselves, okay? But let's take a look at the area that they had. Um, this is Comancheria. You can see that it's kind of like around just north of uh, San, modern day San Antonio and it goes all the way up to New Mexico into the Colorado area. Um, and so they controlled this and with Spanish consent, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Um, so what was Comanche culture like, right? We know that settlers interacted with them. We know that they were known for their raids and for their peaceful exchanges at time too. Um, and Spain is going to make a decision to make an alliance with them over the Apache. Of course, like I mentioned, they might be something they regretted later on. Probably not really because by 1821, they're out of, um, of New Spain anyway. Um, so Again, I want to mention that the horses were absolute center of not only their economic needs, but their, but, you know, their cultural needs. They had a socio-political organization that was somewhat decentralized, um, but it was really centered about who was the best warrior. And that's the person that really became leaders of their different um, groups of Comanche that came about. Uh, the, the tougher the warrior, the more puha they had, okay? Um, they also focused on bride wealth. Uh, anybody that was part of a Comanche household was an active participant. So if you took out and wanted to have a wife from some group um, as a Comanche leader, you would have to pay something in bride wealth. Um, like I mentioned, women and slaves, and the Comanche did take slaves. White settler raids, um, very famously, Cynthia Parker, who's Quanah Parker's uh, mother, um, becomes probably one of the best known, um, you know, uh, raids after they take raids, they took hostages and slaves. Most of the time they really did that so that they could sell um, 
to, uh, you know, back, like take them for ransom, essentially, um, and take money and take money and not money, but, um, you know, they would take um, different uh, things like cattle. And they also took um, they also took horses and things of that nature. So, you know, they're, they were kind of important in that aspect. I can just move myself there. And like I mentioned, by the end of Spanish rule, the Comanche controlled by treaty a vast area known as Comancheria. Okay, so let's kind of change gears and talk about, you know, families on the frontier society. Um, contrary to popular opinion, women were prevalent in frontier society, particularly, particularly in North Texas. Uh, as a matter of fact, married soldiers were actually preferred and people that didn't uh, weren't married. Um, they soon married and there was quite a bit of marriages between different groups of peoples. So uh, many men, many soldiers ended up marrying either indigenous women and there's also records of marrying African women as well. Um, so kind of given an example of that, um, you know, uh, the Canary Islanders, I think only four of them that came over were actually single men, the rest were married families. Um, so this is uh, kind of what it, something really kind of cool about frontier life was the autonomy that women had in frontier society. And this is something that was really not common in the rest of Europe. They had quite a bit of uh, women did not have a lot of autonomy. And that's really important to point out as well. Um, women worked as midwives, um, which are people that kind of regulate and give birth or uh, regulate, you know, birth. Um, and seamstresses, shopkeepers they worked as. Uh, many came from different cultures, so they blended their cultures with kind of local ways, and that's why we see a lot of quite a diversity in Texas. Um, and here's the thing, they were actually regarded as humans. And meanwhile, in Eastern United States, modern United States, which was English settlement, right? Um, women basically were dead once they were born. They didn't become individuals, they lost their, um, they lost all of their land. There was something called primogeniture, which essentially said that all the land goes to the first, uh, first male of the family. So women had to rely on men. They weren't allowed to testify or anything like that. So women in the frontier society had quite a bit of autonomy, which means like self-rule and self-power. So they had the ability to own their own separate property. Um, after marriage, they were entitled to half the property, which was really progressive for that time, right? And they were also able to initiate legal proceedings. They didn't need a man to sponsor them or to do that. Um, they could actually give action, take test, make testimony. And again, this was not so in the rest of the world, particularly like in East Eastern United States at that time in the late 1700s, women didn't have this kind of autonomy, but they did in frontier society. Um, so I talked a, a little bit about the people from Las Odeas, or I talked about how they were going to be relocated. It's important to note that Ruby's assessment was essentially the death warrant for the capital. And some Adisanos, um, they wanted to trade firearms when they arrived in San Antonio with uh, in, with indigenous populations, which they did in East Texas. They weren't allowed to um, because of, you know, the indigenous threat. And so it made things kind of difficult for them. Some things that also made it difficult was they had a really hard time finding land. Um, a lot of them had such a hard time finding land, they had to become sharecroppers, which means they ha would have to rent a space on another landowner's area. Um, they were also worried about that indigenous threat. The presidios were not very strong at that point. So they were really concerned about Indian raids and the land that they were given because they didn't feel very protected. They were a little too far from the presidios. So some of them actually um, leave and they eventually get permission to move to the Camino Real area uh, near the upper part of the Trinity River. Um, that town was called Bucarella. Eventually that town became known as modern day Nagadocious in East Texas, just kind of north of Houston, if you're trying to get an idea of that. Um, so what was the situation uh, with Indians um, in Spanish at that time? Um, Cabello uh, stated that they attempted, um, you know, there was a new vice where his name was Cabello. He basically um, stated they had attempted to make peace with the Apache and that didn't work. And so he wanted to like wage war against the Apache. Okay, he has another inspection done. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that the, the peace was made with the Comanche over the, uh, the Apache. Um, 
Comanche did engage in trading with the Spanish with goods, but scholars kind of disagree um, with what they thought trade was. So trade to the um, Spanish might have said, hey, they're trying to, you know, we're going to try to make them um, dependent on Spanish goods. But the Comanche, the way their thinking was, many scholars actually believe that they saw that as tribute from Spain not to attack. OK, and so when that tribute stops, the, the you know, um, the raiding is going to commence and that's going to become significant a little later on too. In 1785, they recognize the authority and the sovereignty of the area of Comancheria and that is going to become really important too. Um, but this kind of like peacemaking that they did, the war against Apaches, but the uh, relative peace with the other groups, um, they're going to enjoy relative peace until after the Civil War in the 1870s, which we'll kind of pick up about then, okay? Another really significant thing that we need to talk about is the end of the missions, okay? The missions um, become secularized, and although the San Antonio missions on La Bahia, um, which is, uh, La Bahia is today Goliad, um, they still uh, they still function pretty well. Uh, the, the indigenous peoples really didn't convert like they wanted them to, okay? And in addition to that, the indigenous populations were really declining their declining due to diet. Um, hygiene was different, which lowered their immunity levels. Plus, they don't agree with like the European division of labor, um, you know, the work routines. Some of the groups, um, you know, uh, some of the indigenous peoples incorporated the missions in their local, like their seasonal migration, but they really were unwilling to convert. Okay. Um, La, San Antonio and La Bahia are the only missions that are really actively uh, missions anymore. Um, and they had created independent communities, but they also developed other communities around them. So they became um, secularized. OK, and so we begin to see the secularization of um, of these missions at that time. It allowed the crown uh, in 1794. They actually, you know, initiate that official degree decree. Um, but the the missions allowed the crown to free up funds. OK, they didn't need to pay guards and friars and give them stipends anymore. Um, it did allow the indigenous to gain a little bit more autonomy. Um, now, they were kind of called and they become multi-ethnic because they can begin to intermarry, too. But they're considered Christian adults. OK, but that doesn't mean that the friars that most of the friars remain there or the people there really trusted the Indians and the indigenous peoples to like, you know, do their, have their own destiny. They actually um, app appointed magistrates known as just justicias to oversee the indigenous peoples. Okay. And here's kind of a visual of, um, of where these missions were and where a lot of the native American groups are at this time. Let me move myself out of the way so you can actually see that and you can pause it if you want to take a look at that. OK, and the last important thing that we're going to talk about is the growth of this Texas cattle kingdom. OK, um, we know that cattle ranches really begin around 1760 or 1720 to 1780. The missions are the first ones to really develop it. And this is significant because they would develop large stocks and herds that would constitute the need for a large compound. Um, However, one thing that happened, and one of the biggest ones is actually in modern day Floresville. So if you've ever been out to Floresville, um, the, the ranch is no longer there. There's a historical marker out there, but the Rancho de la Cabros, which is, stands for goat ranch or means goat ranch, um, they were the first successful you know, commercial civilian ranch by the 1740s. Now there was disagreement over land rights and, um, and whose cattle was who and who was grazing you know, wherever somebody was later on. Um, so in 1778, the Spanish created legislation that essentially said any unbranded livestock became property of the crown, which would build their coffers up and settle some of these disputes. Now, what this is going to do, this is going to push out smaller ranchers, and this is going to build like large ranches um, in the area. And so smaller ranchers, essentially, they can't afford to do branding and control that. So we see a lot of large ranchers begin to develop. And this is where cowboy culture comes in. The vaquero becomes, uh, which is the cowboy, uh, becomes the cowboy culture really essentially begins. Okay. By the turn of the century, um, by 1800, Ranching is the primary economic activity in, in Texas at that time. Um, San Antonio in 1791, 
had 14 large ranches. By 1800, they had 20. So you see a lot of large ranches begin to develop. Um, so one of the most uh, well-known um, women that become like cattle queens, actually she's nicknamed the cattle queen, was Rosa Maria Hinojosa. And she was uh, married into um, another kind of gentry family from, um, from New Spain and the you know a man named bali and she combines between the two large powerful uh, families they develop a large um large cattle kingdom in south texas now her husband dies and after he dies she gains the uh, region she doubles the land holdings herself uh, she purchases padre island and by the end of her life, she controlled 1 million acres in South Texas. That's pretty significant. Okay, so I just thought I would throw that out there. Okay, so just to summarize, um, you know, what we've learned essentially in this lecture, Spanish officials really did make an effort post um, Seven Years War to improve Texas and the rest of their, you know, regions. They change indigenous relationships, specifically the Comanche gains more autonomy. They, um, by treaty, gain the region um, of sovereignty of Comancheria. Apache lose autonomy and are really waged wars, really waged against them. And important to the secularization of, of the um, missions, which eventually lead to Texas Cattle Kingdom. Okay, I hope that was helpful. And, um, and hope that you learn quite a bit. Next time we'll talk about what happens 1800 and the end of Spanish rule.